This is titled Death of America by Consensus because it's not, we're not being appropriately represented and it's a weird um, interchange, a modification of what we consider representative government and we'll walk through it all. But let me just go through a quick design here. The, the whole idea when you have a homeowners association or you uh, join some group, you've got basically CCNRs where you agree to live by these principles. You can't park your boat on the street. You've got to put it in the side yard or you can't paint your house pink. It's got to follow the color scheme, etc. And that is really just a form of learning to live together so that you can create a well-rounded community and you don't have people, you know, creating cra trash piles in their front yard or salvage um, yards right next to your home. So there's a little bit of give and take here as people join in communities and decide gee, we're having a great relationship, I'm trading my lettuce for your tomatoes, and we're doing fine, but you still owe me a dozen tomatoes. How am I gonna enforce this contract? So we decide some third party ought to be the sheriff, and then we'll assign someone else the duties of the court, and that's the only responsibility we'll give them is those delegated responsibilities. All the rest of our economy, our trades, me changing your, your tires out or working on your carburetor, oops, your fuel injector and that kind of stuff, that all just happens because we're in a community relationship and it's only when things run afoul that we decide we need a sheriff and we need some place to house the guy who is cheating us on our tomato, you know, endeavor, et cetera. So there's a, you know, just sending a few items to designated parties. Our constitution laid that all out. We have representative elections, so we're not a democracy, we're a representative republic, a constitutionally federated republic. Constitutionally federated simply means that we documented all the rules. We laid them all out and we documented them. Those are the rules that government is bound by. Because it, uh, this is really important facet to this idea of government and the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. You guys tell me, what's the best form of government? Republican. Republican. No. Self. Self-governance yeah. is the best form of government. Self-governance is where we really want to go, where you have individual freedom, you've got your liberty at your own fingertips, and you bear the risk and the rewards. You bear personal responsibility, you bear accountability. This is on your shoulders, not on your neighbor's back. It's on your own back. Self-governance is really where we wanna go. We will, however, in certain circumstances, need a, a form of government where we elect representatives to fulfill these responsibilities for us because we all can't run down to City Hall. Even though I am going to recommend that, I'm going to recommend at the end of this that we get involved and we go to the commissioner meetings and we go to the city council meetings and we go to water board meetings and we go to irrigation district meetings and we go to school board meetings. These are things we have to do if you want to save America from this death by consensus. So in general, there is, in our state, we elect a governor, we elect senators, we elect house members. They're the guys who are supposed to do our bidding. And we, all the citizens, go to the ballot box to see how this works. These aren't laws or rules, regulations, or sanctions because we documented them. Uh, Alexander Hamilton says the sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchment or musty records. Alexander Hamilton's talking about old parchments and musty records. That's what people say when I say I believe in the Constitution. 
the Declaration of Independence is my go-to document. They say, why are you looking at that old dusty thing? Alexander Hamilton said, that's not where you find these things. They are written as a sunbeam on the whole volume of human nature. This is natural law. This is what we see in the world around us. We see men struggling with their own freedom, their own responsibility, their own ability to accomplish life in community because there's always a rotten egg in the bunch. And what do you do with that guy? And what we always struggle with is what do you do with that guy? We want to be kind, we want to be generous, but we don't want everything going out the back door. So there's always this tension between fallen man, his natural state, the power that he might gain, and the corruption that comes naturally with it. These are all of those things. But remember, the Declaration of Independence, this primary document for the founding of the United States of America says that we are endowed by our Creator. These come from God Himself because you're human and you've been created in His likeness. You have unalienable rights, the right to life itself and to liberty and risk and reward and your own pursuits, your own happiness, your own endeavors belong to you and no one else. And so this idea is documented in a declaration and in the Constitution, and this is what we're arguing for as conservatives in the modern era. This next slide, I love this. This is a slide that we think a political, uh, what is it, political correctness is a modern concept. And uh, John Adams says, be not intimidated, nor suffer yourselves to be wheedled out of your liberties by any pretense of politeness, delicacy, or decency. So all of a sudden, I'm in love with the word wheedled, right? <laughs> When's the last time you use wheedled in a sentence? Right? Start using wheedled in your sentences and tell people I'm not going to allow you to wheedle me out of my liberties because you sound so nice and you're using such good words and you sound so delicate and decent and politically correct. He continues on and says, these are but three different names for hypocrisy, chicanery, and cowardice. Talk about hitting the nail on the head. This is good, good stuff. 1765, can you believe it? There's nothing new under the sun. This is natural law. This is man. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Absolutely. You are right. And so these are the things we have to be aware of. I took this slide from uh, Ken Ivory. He's the president of the American Lands Council, and he has a, um, an entire series about transferring of federal lands. But I think this slide illustrates how it's supposed to work. You, we know we have an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch. They're in balance, and this wheel rotates smoothly. In fact, we've got just more than three branches of government. Every single state, in a, uh, as a um, Republican states, all have these same three branches. So if you were to put it on the kids' teeter-totter, it would be all of the states and all of their three branches would outweigh the government, you know, 50 to 1, right? Some population centers would be less than others or whatever, but the teeter-totter would be tilted in favor of the states because all of these states are representative governments. They're all Republican in their natural form and they all have, they all follow the same model with regard to this balance of power to avoid concentrated power, to avoid despotism, to avoid tyranny. This is a great design. However, what's happened today, and I love this little phrase down here, job of the Fed, it, it, this, this is Ken Ivory's humor shining out. 
the federal government and their three branches are gobbling up the states. They're taking advantage of the states. They're diminishing state power. I've argued over and over and again that the 17th Amendment was one of those critical pieces. And you probably got flyers that said in the mail, Dennis Linthicum wants to take away your right to vote. How many got that flyer? A, a handful. I'm surprised at the rest of you guys. Come on, you're hurting my feelings now. The point is, the 17th Amendment weakened the power of the states because your senators are no, light, no longer responsible to your state. They're responsible to the latest fad in the marketplace of ideas. And the latest fad in the marketplace ideas was Obamacare. And it became law. And none of your senators stood up and said, no, thank you, we can't afford it. And then, along with the Federal Reserve and fiat money, Oregon says, yahoo, this is great, we're jumping in, we want to build our own exchange. And President Obama here's $300 million and puts it on the table. Tell me who wouldn't be tempted by $300 million, right? So our conservatives or liberals or centrists, Democrats and Republicans, when staring at that big bag of fake monopoly money, couldn't resist. And because they couldn't resist, they essentially sold our freedoms for free money, free medical care, free housing, free food stamps, free you name it, and they sold our liberty to accomplish that. The whole thing went down the drain and nobody seems to mind. Show me where in the federal government it shows a deficit, $308 million, by golly, we want our money back. Nobody wants it back, isn't that weird? If you gave me $308 million to accomplish a task under contract and I did not accomplish the task, would you want your $308 million back? I haven't yeah. ordered that. Yeah, this, this at some point is just <coughs> ridiculous. So the point that I'm trying to make, and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. X, and Mr. X will take the, uh, the microphone from here. The point I'm trying to make is we live in Oregon in a Republican government. The Republican government has those same three branches. It's supposed to be and is designed to be a balance of power. There is no concentrated leg that carries more weight than any other leg. There is a natural tension, a natural balance, a natural synergy in everybody arm wrestling and demanding their own power and own authority and it belongs to them and belongs to them alone. And nobody else can take it from us. That's the way our Congress should be fighting President Obama. You don't have authority to make laws. That's our authority. And we should be fighting the judicial branch with the same tone and the same fervor. And our representative guys, if they're not doing your bidding, throw them out. It's about time we got up out of our chairs and said enough is enough. I'm going to circle back at the end and we're going to talk about what we can do. So right now let me introduce uh, Mr. X and he'll take the mic from me. transfer. I didn't turn it off. Nope, we hear you. Good evening and thank you for coming. This is a real <laughs> blinding experience there. And it's, it's a lot different doing it up here than it is doing it on the radio with Bill. So you'll have to forgive me on a couple of things that'll go on. As we look at this, it was important when Dennis and I started and we looked at this tonight. I ask him to stop on this page because this particular section is the most critical and crucial that there is. 
That is where they have hijacked everything that we know as America. Okay? There was a program enacted in 1989 in the Oregon legislature that was called the Dispute Resolution Commission. Now, you have to understand what has happened since then. With the creation of the Dispute Resolution Commission, it was a statewide, county by county program that worked with the court system and the justification was to reduce court costs through the load of the court cases that were there at that time. Now, they ran into some financial problems. In the handout that you have in the blue cover, you'll find a, the, one of the most critical pieces that you can have, and it is a letter or an article that was written defining what went on. Okay? So what happened, they dissolved the Dispute Resolution Commission as it was in 2003. Now this program functioned from 1989 until 2003 and did a good job. At that point, that was when Kulingowski was governor, okay? Kitzhaber was about coming into being governor, or just right at that point had. So all of the things were set in place to look at it and say, okay, this is what we want to follow. We want to follow a way that people are not paying attention to, and we want to take different aspects of power away from everyone. So the bottom line is, they came in, created this program, dissolved it, and gave it to the University of Oregon at the Hatfield School of Law. That's the simplistic explanation. When they did that, they legislatively made the university system a state agency, or Portland State University a state agency, but included the rest of the university system. As you look through here, you'll start seeing some of the connective dots, okay? And when this started, when we started talking, I, I, I started by drinking coffee at 3 o'clock in the morning and running my computer and starting looking. And at 6, Bill would come on and he'd be, you know, ranting about something or they'd be talking about something or some news of the day was, well, we're losing another right. We're lo they're attacking property rights here or they're going after this or going after that. And I said, so I started using that time and I started thinking, well, let me see if what I can find. Well, this is what I found. I found the tool that they have implemented to create this as a means to control every aspect of our lives. That's the simplicity of it, if you look at it. They go in through here, you have your Oregon Dispute Resolution, you go over to the abolishment, you come down to the PSU School of Law, the Hatfield School of Government. Through that, you have the National Policy Consensus Center. That is one of the beasts, okay? I refer to this a lot as a beast, as, as something, a multi-headed beast. This goes everywhere, and its tentacles are everywhere. The National Policy Consensus Center works nationwide. But over here, we have the Policy Consensus Initiative. Over on the other side, we have the Oregon Solutions Program. A lot of you may have heard of it, maybe not. It is there. Under the Oregon Solutions, you got your regional solution centers, you got the Oregon Solutions Network, you got the regional advisory committees, you got the regional coordinators, COGS, like RV COG, you have Oregon Consensus, and they're partnered with all the state agencies and the federal agencies. By sheer nature of them making this a state agency, it gave them cooperative status on any level. They can bring people from any aspect of our lives. The forestry, water, the biggest thing that they did a few years ago was they created what they called the Oregon Integrated Water Resources Strategy. Okay? This was a method that we see in the news just in the past few days that came about with the Gold Hill with the irrigation problem. Okay? It was all done under this strategy. Now this strategy is related to another document. Now I don't know, I don't think that we did that one there, but I'll bring it to here so you can see that part of it. And I'll go back to that one after I do this. Well when you see, and if you have any doubts that this exists, the executive orders, if you go to this executive order 1112, this verifies, okay, totally everything there. And I can let you read that, or I can read it, it doesn't matter. It makes me sick when I read it. 
It makes me sick because if you transfer the amount of power that they have assumed and look at our lives of how we suffer on a daily basis because of it, it is just, it gets to a point where it's exasperating. So it made me mad. I dug deeper and I dug deeper and I dug deeper. And I kept digging until I could find and try to, you know, get to a point where we could come. I want to go back for one moment, okay? Remember this one, the National Policy Consensus Center. This is the mission statement, okay? <clears throat> to play a catalytic role in helping state leaders develop a collaborative system of governance, PCI and NPCC, create and support collaborative governance capacities, structures, and networks in states, offers a nationally recognized source of information on collaborative governance, consensus building, and conflict resolution. Now you notice how they went to conflict resolution. That justifies the dispute resolution program that houses all of this, or they fund it through. So now as we sit here and we look at that, what does all of that mean? Collaborative governance. Collaborative governance means that as property owners, you are not a true stakeholder. The people that are out there are coming in and voting in their own groups for your property rights. That's the eventuality because they're on a war against property rights. And I'll go into more of that in a short time here. But when you break these down, this is just the most nightmare part of all of this, the National Policy Consensus Center with the Policy Consensus Initiative. Because if you take just the names of what you have there and you break that down, the National Policy Consensus Center, well, they're working with the feds. They work with the feds on every level. Now they use that and then they go over through their agency status and their cooperative status with Oregon Solutions. And Oregon Solutions just ran the uh, BLM RMP program. If anybody here, has anybody here went over to the BLM offices for the resource management plan? Well, if you saw that, it was, it, the biggest part of that you have to understand is Oregon Solutions ran the whole process. As the public, when you went in there to talk to them, which is your right, which is by law a mandate, you didn't get to talk about the issues because the issues were already done by the stakeholders that were selected. Now these stakeholders that they select in these programs are groomed. They're groomed at a point where they come in as agreeing to the end before it begins. They actually have to agree before they're considered. And they also are picked, they're selected. The governor has lists and lists of people, organizations that he pulls these people out of. They come in, they become the stakeholders. The stakeholders create a situation where they can make administrative law. So this is the biggest thing that ties back and the best example is the integrated water resources strategy. Because if they figured out if they controlled water, what do they control? Everything in our lives. Everything. The thing is, how do we, how do we look at that and say, they, that, well, that can't be. That can't be. Well, it is. And this is what they've done. They've used the processes that they create. And as they create these processes, when we go down, we're suffering right now with RV Cog. Who knows the function of RV Cog here? What do you think it is? I'll ask you. I'm actually on the board for RV Cog. Okay. What do you do with grants? Uh, actually, the, the grants are there to perpetuate RV Cog. Mm -hmm. If you, if you don't have grants, then you're not going to be able to do it. Well, they source grants for the cities, too. They source grants for the cities. They and that's my point. Mm -hmm. And they source those grants, yes. and they keep sourcing the grants. So in my mind, when I analyze RV COG and I look at it, it is part of the Oregon Solutions Network, okay? And if you look at the layers of all of those groups, it comes at that bottom layer where it is the local representative of the Oregon Solutions, where they decide if they want to put up a stakeholder process to create an effect, to create a means to an end. And they, do quite frequently. they do all the time all the time. There is nothing in our lives that isn't touched by that program. I pick RV Cog because that's the closest thing in the newspapers that you're going to see about this. But in reality, the RV Cogs come underneath the Oregon Consensus, the Oregon Solutions, and the Regional Solution Centers. 
They are sitting back in one location outside of our region and saying, here is the problem of that region that we want to address. Now, it might be totally different than the problems that we're looking at or facing. I, I look at it as a very simple thing that just troubles me to this day because as I look out in my neighborhood and I look out in our area, water is one of the critical things right now because of the dry season. And I watched ODOT come in under, you know, in order to remove Gary Harrington's ponds. Now, I look up there and I've seen them dip out of those things. Okay, they, the helicopters come in and they put out fires. What idiocy is it to remove a source to protect our property. Well, the bottom line is, in my research, everything that I found, they've come to a point, they are moving to not care about your property rights at all. So, let it burn. That's the reality of the situation. Dave? Yeah, part of it is they get their marching orders through the Oregon Solutions Network, okay, for Oregon Solutions and Governor Kitzhaber. Governor Kitzhaber sits on the land use board, okay. He is the guy, he's the main guy. He sits up there with two other people they, and basically can make any decision that we face. But when you track and you look through all of these points, any project that we've had here locally in the valley, anything that we see running through all of this, has been affected by this Oregon Solutions and the Oregon Solutions Network. They convene a stakeholder group, they decide what to do, and we're not involved in the picture 99.9% .9 of the time. Go ahead. Okay, and I agree with that because I've been to different things. And on the board are elected officials from the area. The reason why most of those elected officials have the clue what Kong is all about, where it comes from, they don't have any clue as what to Agenda 21 is or anything. Right. And they just go there because that's what they've been tasked to do by whatever uh, city council they're on, or uh, if they're injecting for the water, if they're so ready, if they're, whether the colleges, because both, uh, both colleges are represented there, uh, the state's represented there, and it's most people will not look deeper than the lunch that's served to them. Right. <laughs> I look at, what I looked at in it was who they reported to. Who, who they took orders from, marching orders. When I look at this, if you go in in this, uh, what you were handed out in the blue, in the blue uh, covered thing, there's the executive order. It's four pages. I can't go into the whole thing here. But by the time you reading finish, you finish reading the executive order, you'll have an understanding of how this exists and the powers that it has. It's an effective way to remove our local people from decision-making powers. The RV COG, like I said, comes down to distributing money that we're lacking in this region. They source grant revenue. They source a lot of things. They're involved in every decision that comes about with that part of it. But they are how to say, underneath the solutions program. They're, they're underneath the network of all of this in this consensus-based program because they decided a long time ago that the consensus was necessary because of the legal disputes that occurred a lot of times across the board. So every time that you came, how to say, into a problem with the local, you know, like, let's say the forest problem, the, the timber problem, the timber issue, and okay, they, they imagine it to be a, a legal battle first, so they start this mediation process in advance through the alternative dispute resolution. That's how they justify it. And they justify it nationwide. If you go into do any type of searches, you can go into a Google search, you can go into most any aspect of this and type in ADR uh, across the country or ADR legal tool. You, you will, you'll be surprised. You will be flabbergasted at what you find. But what we go back to with what Dennis talked about earlier, this, all of this was not part of anything that we signed on for. None of this was part of anything that we have as a common understanding of what this country was supposed to be about. The bottom line comes down to it's a very top-down, single decision-making point. 
and they show a legal aspect. When, there, when there's bills and there's laws, there's an understanding that there is agreement, that it's a necessary and there has to be documentation on that point. And they're substituting for it. That's what they're doing. Yes, sir. I can understand opportunities created by indifference, but what, since these are all Oregon citizens that serve in these various capacities, what possible motive or ulterior motive did the creators of Oregon Solutions really have? Funny money. Monopoly money. Let me, can I hold on to that for a moment? And let me go to two other things, and you may see it yourself. You may see it yourself, okay? And that's why I want to do it. And if not, I'll go back and I'll address that, okay? If you look at their mission as part of that, to play a catalytic role, okay, in every part of what they want to do in the state. Top down, everything goes. When you go to this site here, this one here comes down to another cap on this whole thing. What is circled is the UNCG, okay? And this is called the University Network for Collaborative Governance. Now, if you read through the entire face there, it doesn't take long. Consensus, Policy Consensus Initiative, National Policy Consensus Center, Public Solutions, a System for Collaborative Governance. Now, these people here with the UNCG, they're linked with every university in the country. Well, what are universities filled with? Socialists. That's the bottom line. So now where do you think their collaborative governance is going? What direction are they going to push for? What are they going to do? And going back, and when I look at this, why, why do they do it? They do it through na being naive. They, they don't fully understand the end result of what they're doing. By the they don't look past their lunch, that's right. By the time that they understand it, it'll be too late. That's why I started talking. That's why I started trying to say, you know, watch it. This is where they're going. You know, try to do this. Try to understand what's happening with it. Yes, sir. I'm a stroke victim, and there's a lot of things that I've forgotten and a lot of things I remember. And I remember standing in New York City. Mm -hmm. Back when Nikita Khrushchev came to this country, I was in the vestibule of the United Nations downstairs watching the TV set when he took his shoe off and beat it on the desk. Yep. And when he came out, he pointed his finger at people and he says, we're going to take you over from within. That's, it. That's exactly what's happening. That's you have, that is what a, a good analysis of it because that is really what's happened if you truly track it. But if I go into it in the way of how it's tracked like that, I gotta make you aware of how big it is and what they're doing, okay? And if I go into the, you know, if I tear it all apart, I can go on for five hours. I only have 45 minutes, so. Um, give me a few moments here to debate where I wanted to go next. Now here we come in again public solutions, a system for collaborative governance, system based on these principles, transparency and accountability, equity and inclusiveness, <laughs> effectiveness and efficiency, responsiveness, forum neutrality, consensus-based decision making. Now this is what you have to look at. This is a crock. Okay, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. That's how I'll define it. <laughs> well, when you look at it, transparency, that's the only one that's not a crock. You know why? It's in your face. It's been all around us and no one could see it. It's been around us for years and no one could see it. So every time that any group of, like, say, conservative minded people come, we want more transparency in government. They said, oh, we just figured out a way to give it to you. Okay? You can't see this for anything. <laughs> you know? So the whole process works at this point. When you, when you go through it and you understand the simple principles of this, I'll, I'll let you read through this part of it, but when you look at the results, 
This is their own words. This is what they say. Well, then I'll read it then. then the, I'll, let me read the bottom one first. How is this different from government? Governance is the process by which public ends and means are identified, agreed upon, and pursued. This is different than government, which relates to the specific jurisdiction in which authority is exercised. Governance is a broader term and encompasses both formal and informal systems of relationships and networks for decision making and problem solving. So in other words, they're going to do whatever it takes to get what they want. That's, that's what that whole thing says in a nutshell. So we look at what results. Collaborative governance won't simply be undone in the next year of legislative session. It won't be. Because it's hidden. You have to find it. You have to track it. You have to look at it and say, what did they accomplish? This is another sample from the PCI, okay, or National Policy Consensus Center and the PCI. Community sustainability. Now you go through this list and what do you have here? You have Oregon Solutions. You have California Solutions. Maine Solutions. Virginia Solutions. Now, if you doubted anything up to that point, it's not my words. I told Bill when we started talking about this, None of this is my words, basically. It's everything comes from their own quotations, their own words. And when you look at it and you start seeing that they're going nationwide and you start tracking the distribution processes nationwide and everything that they're doing, my head starts spinning because I've done it. I've sat there for and looking at this stuff and you go nuts. And you literally look at it and say, how do we stop this beast? How do we, how do we go ahead and stop it? Well, the first thing is you acknowledge it. And then we have to get together like this. We have to get together and start understanding how they passed it around, how the power got there. And we have to start pushing back somehow, some way. This defines Oregon Solutions, okay? Oregon Solutions is an NPCC-based host program that helps communities develop sustainable and collaborative projects that address challenges and opportunities. And I look at that and I say, well, that ties us into the sustainable thing. Well, along about this time, you have to remember, I read this so long ago, I started looking other places with that. Well, then I get into the roadmaps. They have, the Oregon has developed issue like, um, it's a roadmap to 2020 and a vision plan to 2050. Now, if you take the roadmap to 2020, that's the most current thing. I looked at it like a schedule. I said, where's their schedule? If they've gone to this much effort, Where's their schedule? Well, I looked through and I finally found it. And that was the roadmap to 2020. What was going to be their next step? That's what I wanted to predict. What's their next step? If I see their plan, then I can see it coming. But it keeps coming. We talked on, uh, I, on Bill's show I heard the other day we were talking. But it was the buildings in downtown Medford. I tracked the whole thing where it goes back to the university system. The university system was involved. We look at it and under normal standard things, there should be a local architect and we should have some local involvement in designing this thing. We should have some local input that counted. You know why? Because we're paying for it on our water bills. That's the reality. But yet, somebody else got to design it far away. Somebody else had the input, the stakeholder input. Or, or the regional solutions network program of how they accomplished it, and if you go through it. And Bill. I remember uh, the, uh, how Medford signed on to... The Sustainable State Cities State Initiative. State that's, 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 thank you, Bill. Because that, that's where this takes you right here. Medford as a city signed on to the Sustainable City Initiative, which is part of the Oregon program that they have with this whole consensus-based program. Now again, it comes down to funding. It comes down to grants. You remember the alleyways that we were talking about a while back. It was all over the newspaper, paving the alleyways. So much pollution, so much runoff, so much this, so much that. You know, but This is their program to do it, but it's a way of divvying out money to buy cooperation. The cities get money. The cities are able to say, oh, I went to work for you. I got you this contract to build the alleys. Well, how many other things do we need besides paid alleys, you know? 
I, I look at it and it's like, where are the priorities in this program? I was talking to someone a little bit earlier and it's like, I get out there and I go in there and this is what I thought of when I was out there. It's a cautionary note. This is the MPCC mission and services document and that there, underneath that there's a, a program of publications that they have. Government sponsored consensus processes are not the traditional forms in which policies are made, administered, or adjudicated in a democracy. In traditional forms and mechanisms for determining who participates directly in the writing and administration of law are spelled out in constitutions, charters, statutes, and rules. Consensus seeking processes are adjuncts to traditional democratic processes. They can shift the focus of public decision making. That line outlined in red is the most critical thing for you to consider because this was their failing point. This is the point at which they fail because they knew this, that it's not, it's not really constitutional. The Constitution of you, in Oregon, if you take the Constitution of Oregon and you do a word search on it, and type in consensus, type in collaborate, collaboration, type in a word search on governance, not one result comes up. Not one. So our Constitution is formed not to consider any of this as we look at it, as we break this down, as we understand it. So where, what, when, why, and how? The university system is so large with this, they're involved on every level in basically every state. And then you start going in the, I think it's um, Northwestern in, in Illinois or something. You start reading back and forth the communication between their wondrous goals and ambitions. And it, then you go back to the document that I was talking about, the Oregon Roadmap to 2020. And then they have their vision plan for 2050. The only problem with the Roadmap to 2020 is probably 35 to 40 percent of it, say 2050. Okay, so you look at it and say, well, they're long-term dreamers. They're long-term visionaries. But you know what? They're trying to accomplish everything, and this is 2014. How many years we, do we have left before 2020? If that's their roadmap to 2020, if that's their program, if that's their schedule, we only have six years left. The intensity of this administrative attack on everything that we do is going to intensify and intensify and intensify until we learn and we understand this tool that they engineered to come after us. This is a definition of stakeholder, and it's actually a very pleasant definition. There's some others that I've developed, but I don't know if I'll share all of those. You say they're going to come after us. What's wrong with us going after them? <laughs> well, we'll entertain some of that. That's, I, I, if you look at it and say our own solutions, okay, those are the solutions that we have to figure out for us. You know, we have to develop our own solutions network. We have to develop a way to come after this and say, you know, there's got to be a legitimate way to go after this and stop it. But when you look at this, this is their prime, another primary weapon that they do, stakeholders. Noun, person or group owning a significant percentage of a company's shares. A person or group not owning shares in an enterprise, but affected by or having an interest in its operation, such as the employees, customers, local. In, in point of fact, their stakeholder system views it as a, almost a gambling win. Okay? They're vying for your property rights. And again, you have to go back. It's a constant game of connect the dots all over, because you have to go back to their integrated water resources strategy because they convened a stakeholder group to put this together. Now this document went back to the DEQ and became part of the administrative law. Minor Dave in the back faces that all the time. Administrative law, administrative rule. All he wants to do is go out there and do whatever it is he wants to do. But he can't do it because the administrative rules under the DEQ. Well, how do we get there? Well, we got there, the DEQ and all of this was convened because an environmental organization sued the EPA. It's called Sue and Settle. 
So they sued the EPA, then the EPA comes into the DEQ and says, well look, your water standards aren't up. I have, I have copies of these things that are, it, just, it, it made me sick to my stomach when I sat down and really read them. But the bottom line comes down to the EPA goes to them and says, this is what you have to accomplish. Well, the DEQ now can say, hey, we need to convene Oregon Solutions in here. We have to have a stakeholder process. We have to have an ADR process. So when you finalize it and you look at it and you get to that point, these people are taking opportunity. Again, they're another group that calls out, oh, they seize opportunities, seize opportunities, seize opportunities. Well, what's their goal? How many opportunities are going to see and where sees and what are they going to go to? What's their goal? And that's what you have to look at. If you look at what their goal is, their goals are defined in this standard for 2020. But they're really interesting goals. But I look at it and it's like, no, their goal has to be something else. But it's, you can't prove that because that's the part that's not in writing. But it's, it's like a pipe dream effect that they have. They have a not a real world viewpoint of anything. And I look at it and it, it's troubling in every level. Can you give us an example of that vision? Say that again? Can you give us an example of the vision 2020? The biggest one that, that I'll do it is more or less a, a thing that I laughed at because it came with diesel engines and semi trucks, okay? And by 2020, their vision was to have the, how to say, the semi-trucks that we see every day have no emissions whatsoever. They're all zero emission. And when, when the folks that wrote this, and when the folks that wrote it came down from Portland, well, they would travel by rail. They would travel by rail to Medford, to the wild areas, you know. And as you read further, it, it gets to a point, if I took the document where I have it highlighted, You'd be, you'd be sitting and saying, this can't be true. Because it sounds like two kids on a, on a trip, or a carload of kids on a trip, on their first road trip, you know, their first year of college. Oh man, we're going here, we're going there. Like, oh yeah, this is this, and this is the way I want it when I get there. But as they go through the thing, and that's part of the, of the situation that they're trying to shoot for. But they, they do it in ways of, ambiguous, they want to shut down property on, the, on this, this whole thing. If I go into it, it's going to take me longer, and I hope you'll bear with me. I have to shift my head into all of these documents. And The bottom line is they want to reduce population. Klamath Falls, where Dennis is from. They want to reduce population. They want to transfer lands to the tribes. They want to transfer water rights in the eventualities of it. But the bottom line is you read through all of their documentation, they document this is what they want to do. They want the city confined. Our building designs that we were talking about a moment ago, I wasn't going to go into it this heavy, but it really angers me. Their whole thing, we, we did a thing here a while back, on, there was a farm on Hillcrest across from the country club, 900 acres. They wanted to rezone and create low income housing and do all of the things. Well, you look at it, that's just part of their vision plan. That's part of the plan that they were doing to create this wonderful, sustainable community of Medford. And they look ahead and they have all this vision for what it'll be like with all the little multi-use buildings and everybody condensed into a 10 by 10 apartment. And if you think that I'm being exaggerative, read, read the document. Just look it over and read it. You can find it on the internet, there'll be links in there where you can find this stuff. And as we travel through and we look at the whole thing, when I sit back and I, I think of it now, it just makes me ill. Because this is the thing that guides them. All of these people that are involved in this program, the, they look at it and they say, I don't care. I don't care that you've spent your life working for your home. I don't care if you've spent your life sitting in your home on your property improving it. This is what I want to do. They're getting rid of the property rights respect that our government, our country, was founded on. Okay? How do they get rid of the 
they plant, do they say anything you found on, since 2020 seems to be the magic mark here, are they going to reduce the population, do they say? Well, first they want to move it to urban areas. How does that reduce it, though? <laughs> you tell me. I mean, I look at it and I mean, I could probably, you know... I mean, reducing it means... Swastikas, death camps, well, starvation. You can go into that side of it and, and go to that, and that you know, there's logical ways that they can do. It. And you, you, what you're saying, that's one of the reasons that I did all this. Okay, that's one of the reasons I started reading it, because I look at it. I was going to bring tonight something for you to, to to view, but I figured that we wouldn't have time. But it was a disc. It was a World War II documentary, and. It, it detailed it with actual footage from that time period, from and it from World War II, okay. And it detailed the common things that Italy, Japan, and Germany did as countries. And the biggest thing that struck me it was three items that they had similar. Number, I think they gave up their constitutions. The two items that I I counted on that I just couldn't believe was that number one, they gave up their constitutions, and number two, they gave up their right to trial by jury. Well, giving up your right to trial by jury is consensus. It's, it's administrative law. That's what it comes down to. Consensus is administrative law. We look at the television shows that you guys see on, that are now with judges all over. There's probably six or seven of them. I don't really know. Maybe five. I you know. But the bottom line is none of these judges are shown as judges with juries. They're all shown. They're literally conditioning people that are watching this to a point that one person at administrative law decides what goes on. Not a jury. Not a jury. And it's just, it's absolutely, and I believe it's in our Constitution that you have the right to a trial by jury. Okay? Absolutely. That's it. Bottom line. Stated that simply. And when you look at it, that's the attack. That the attack is conditioning. It's social conditioning. We talked the other day. Part of this, the the uh, Medford buildings. The, you come into it, and there was three definitions in the book, or three three members to this. But the last part of it was social. What was it, Bill? Social uh, restructuring, or I don't want to say. I hadn't planned on talking about that. So. Social engineering. <laughs> I mean, that gets the point across. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's like it's in their own documents that part of this is social engineering. So when you look at it and you think of your kids, you think of everybody in the future going through all of this, what do we do? You know, if they're going to engineer our lives, well, they've got a good start. All of the background, all of the basis for that engineering program is there. Go ahead. Uh, and how easily could this Agenda 21 be dismantled if we had a new governor named Dennis Richardson? Very easily. It could be dismantled. Provided that we push our elected officials for an end. Now, I believe Dennis has stated that he would move to that. But it could be dismantled quickly. Well, if, if we ask for it. You know, that's the, that's the whole key. See, the whole key is that we have to start asking for it. We have to start claiming what is our right. And our right is to be what Dennis defined and showed you earlier. I mean, we don't have anything that allows them to do this and control and take unconstitutional advantage of the situation that we live in. But the thing is, is that it's gone so far. It's so deep. The money has transferred hands. Just one, one part of this system is the Hatfield Marine Institute or something they call it. It's on the coast. Newport. What's that? Newport. 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 You know how much money they got to do that, though? There's billions and billions and billions. If I remember the figure, it's like almost $40 billion changed hands for that project and why. Because they're part of their program is to convene stakeholder groups to control the watershed. That's what they want to do. Well, if they control the watersheds, what happened in Gold Hill? That's the connection. You look at it. Controlling the watershed 
is controlling that irrigation source in Gold Hill. So what do you do? They're, they're doing it on every level, and they're funded. And then they're using the model, going state by state. Here. since this thing is really lacking any real legal foundation. I, mean, I know they got their legislative thing, the Constitution. Has anybody brought any suits or anything when this bumps okay. into them? The purpose of doing this that I've talked with on Bill's show was done to, how to say, when I stumbled upon it and it became, how to say, more and more apparent, I'm one guy. Yeah. And all I can do is try to keep talking and try to give people some, but I mean, some movement like to it. The farm, the this, the guy's pond, what have you, they're ripped out and these people show up. Uh, ultimately, where are they going to cite for authority since it's not based in any kind of... Well, they cited him under the, the DEQ rule, and the administrative rules. And that's the point. That's what I'm saying. See, there's a different judge. There's a, you know, yeah, whoever know they that. have for the judge for that part of it. And, you know, when you go and you understand that part of it, you know, it's an illustration that you can't forget. And this is, like I said well, earlier, and I don't know if I got to it at all. Um, I'm covering things that I didn't actually intend to. I was going to make it more simple. But if we get complex, okay, we go to the Biscuit Fire area, you get 500,000 acres of destroyed forest land. And I mean, and if you go out to the middle of it, it is destroyed. Now, the environmental people that caused that not to be useful, they call it a perfect snag forest. It's not a perfect snag forest. If you go out there, you get into the center of it. And I mean, I'm talking, when, when we go in, we go into these small little areas that haven't been used in years. We get into the middle of it, and you go down, and you look, walk down the grades, and you see these. It looks like artillery shells went off. The fire got so hot, it burnt the trees into the hillside, it burnt the root systems. Now what logically happens? Here you have the entire mountainsides are coming down into the creeks. There's a creek out there, I think it's Silver Creek. You get out there. Now, Alan Bates put it on his protected streams thing on SB 838, okay? Well, if you want to protect it, why are you letting it get filled with whole hillsides? How, how does that do it? Because the basis that you're protecting it with is called a TMDL, a total maximum daily load of sediment or pollutant or whatever. They have their list, and that's how they control it. There was a big thing about closing down the forest roads under too much runoff and sediment coming into the streams. And it went all the way, I believe, up to the, almost the Supreme Court, if not the Supreme Court. And a judge ruled, no, you can't do that. The environmentalists were out of line. They couldn't do that. So you look at it, and there is hope in those regards. There are some judges that do it. You're going to look in, your, in, the, in that handout earlier, and you're going to see a little uh, paragraph out of it. And this is from the uh, Judicial Education Program from the Environmental Law Institute. And if you read that, you'll start understanding why we have so much trouble. We have to become involved. We have to have 
everybody <laughs> judges in everything. We have to question, we have to ask, we have to push. When we elect a judge, when we try to push an official on any level, we have to understand where they stand on this. Because if you go through and you read this, this is literally, they're funding it so they go learn United Nations laws on environment. Okay? So when you look at that and you understand that simple aspect, you're going in front of a judge. And you don't know if he's going to use American law or he's going to side with the environmental aspects of it. One of the things that just totally just burned me was I read an article in, in the Medford Tribune. Well, that'll do it anyway, I agree. And I saved this. This is one of those things. Fire bomber gets five-year prison term. She was part of a group, Earth Liberation Front, several others. Forty million dollars in damage. Now she spent seven years on the run. Seven years running in Canada. She became a Canadian citizen, I guess, too. Because she has to be, how to say, she, they have to make her a U.S. citizen in order for her to carry out the sentence. But what you have to understand is the judge. Now, this is a person who willfully was part of $40 million worth of damages all over the West. And the judge, U.S. District Judge Ann Aiken said Monday in federal court in Portland that Reuben showed contrition and lived in an emotional prison cell during seven years as a fugitive in Canada. Okay? Aiken said she understood Reuben's desire to see a change in how animals in the environment are treated. But she said Reuben's actions, which included contributing to several arsons, did serious damage. That kind of damage is not how democracy works, or how true change is accomplished, Aiken said. So now, look at that statement. That's not how true change is accomplished. Go back here, and you read the prison sentence, okay? And I'm going to shorten this to the top of the first paragraph. Aiken included in her sentence in order to read two books. <laughs> David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell, through which Aiken said Reuben could learn nonviolent means to protesting systems she perceives as unjust, and Nature's Trust by University of Oregon environmental law professor Mary C. Wood. <laughs> so, besides the minimal prison term, she gets ordered to read two books. One of them by who? A University of Oregon law professor. So magically, if you research Mary Wood, which I did, you, you go, you, you just get to a point you, you can't believe. It's endless. But they've developed a system. Nature's Trust, a paradigm for natural resources stewardship. If you read anything about this woman, if you get her book, I urge you not to buy it, try to buy it, try to get it for free, but <laughs> in any event. <laughs> yeah. it, what it comes down to is there is an active legal principle in our country called the public trust doctrine, okay? And it's been basically used for rivers. Any navigable river they've used it on in order to ensure that, you know, everything can stay the way that it should for usage of the river for transportation. That's the basics of the public trust doctrine. That's what, that's almost the entirety of its use. Now, she wants to change, and she's doing it by imprinting upon young people that that doesn't exist. Now we have one called nature's trust, okay? Now, if you go into it and you start Connecting more dots. Here's one of the key players in the university system. Now you have all of the environmental aspects of control that they want to do. Her whole philosophy of control comes down to nature's trust of what she defines as stuff. Now I don't have the time to go into the whole thing because by the time I'm reading it, you'd have to carry me out. I'd be sick to my stomach, number one. I, I just... Everything that comes out of this is anti-property rights. Every part of it is anti-property rights. I'll suffice it to say. She basically openly hates property and your right to do with your property what you want to do. And that's in, I urge you all to read these things and develop your own interpretation of it or look at it and understand it.
but you have to do it in a way that connects the dots to all of the other things. If you go back here to this slide, Oregon Solutions, solving community problems in a new way. Ah, uh, sure, <laughs> they sure are. But if you go down here and you look at this, our mission is to develop sustainable solutions to community-based problems that support economic, environmental, and community objectives and are built through the collaborative efforts of business, government, and non-profit organizations. Boy. I didn't see any of you mentioned in there. I, I, I just don't see it. Now, if you go to the Hatfield site, I just stumbled on this yesterday. You go to the Hatfield. In, um, it's one of the programs for a Master's of Public Administration. Hey, you read this thing and you look at it, and well, here they are, and they, they're outlining all of this stuff. Part of the Master's degree for Public Administration. They're training all of the people that they want to enter into public service in getting money efficiently for nonprofit organizations. Now why? It's free. So they can have more stakeholders. So they can rule by consensus. It is part of a vicious circle. It takes analyzing it. It takes looking at it. It takes reading it and looking at what purposes and things that they're trying to accomplish. I, myself, looked at it and said, like I said, the vision plan to 2050. That's their leading document. It was adopted in, I think, 2010 by the Environmental Commission. Um, and the bottom line is, is that that's what they resort to. So that gives them their legal basis. Well, this was adopted. The DEQ can say they can cite the environmental aspects of it. You look at this. This is a map that shows you how the regional solution centers are broken up. I have uncovered or read documentation down of committee meetings on certain things that aren't even local. They're, they're actually more fun to see them all. <laughs> when I get in there and I read it and I look at it and you just look at how they talk about this thing. It's about, well, we're going to control this aspect. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it's like nobody cares. But we look at this and how they do it. Here you go. Region, North Coast region, Mid Valley region, South Valley region, South Coast region, South Southern region. We have the Metro region, Central region, North Central region, South Central, Greater Eastern, Northeast. They have all of these are connected in a micromanaged control based situation so they can do this stuff. How is this affecting you today? Go ahead. A uh, question that's been bothering me for a while. Uh, I hear rumblings about putting meters on wells. Yeah, that actually, I believe, I think that passed. That did pass? No. Yeah, I believe that it did. I'm not sure. I know I was right on top of it at one point. but. No, I'm talking about putting meters on. Oh, yeah. That, I believe that they actually passed. The, it's an administrative. It's gone into an administrative thing. Okay, and I, I believe that the actual legislation on it passed that they said they could do it, but they haven't enacted it yet. See, their problem is one thing. If they enact, um, how to say, a plan to do all of this at once, what's going to happen? Well, that's what I mean. It'll be an incremental thing. And you see the incremental things like proving a point. And again, the Gary Harrington case. When you look at taking his property and destroying his ponds, okay, that was the thing saying, okay, get an example, folks. He did jail time twice, if I remember correctly. Every part of this is set up so that you have... You know, they're looking at how, how the control factor can come about. And that was one case example. That's why they probably pushed ahead to do it. Because once they enact something else, like the WISE program. In the WISE program, how many of you know about the WISE program? Everybody here is usually well informed. Well, for those of you that don't, the WISE program is they want to pipe and run all of the irrigation water in the Rogue Valley all over. They want to remove the ditch system that we have, the actual gravity-fed ditch system, and turn it into pumped irrigation. Well, what's going to happen when they can turn off your irrigation water? 
do exactly what you Whatever they to want is going to happen. They can do it anyway. That, well, they can, but it's a lot harder with the ditch system. It you know? costs more. Well, the other aspect of it is if they're going to meter that, what do we do about cost? What do we do when they say, oh, well, you're, you know, we really find that um, growing that particular crop is not sustainable. So we're, we're going to put an additional revenue cap on you. You're going to have to pay double your water usage fees for doing that, and your meter will tell us exactly what it is. Well, that's, that's exactly it. The whole plan is to densify and rewild, okay? If you look at the actual aspects of it, that's their intention. They want to rewild, they want to densify, bring the cities in close together, the urban growth boundaries totally controlled, use every bit of land within that boundary as you know the way they decide it should be used, even though you got 900 acres of farmland or whatever you want to use, well, they, they want you to build apartments on it. Well, eventually, the administrative side, they're going to force you to do it. Uh, the other day, they were talking about sage grouse. If you want to, you know, go look at sage grouse. You look at all of these things. They're doing them under, it was done with a collaborative se session. It was done with stakeholders. They put people together. They put people that would answer the way they wanted to because by controlling the sage grouse, they can control your private property. That's the simplicity to it. And there is a sage grouse strategy. There's a sage grouse initiative. There's everything, and it all boils down to that. The KBRA, I'm going to give you one example, and it, I believe it's in the links in the book that you have there. You can get to it. But it's called the Klamath Watershed Partnership. Okay? They're wonderful organizations, very hardy environmentalists. They want to take everything and do everything, you know, heartfelt. Okay? Well, on that page that's in the only problem with this that I found, and you talked about Agenda 21, you talk about all of the different things, it all relates back to certain things because the reality came in on that page, there was one, it talked about getting a $400,000 grant. And this is the big fight that came up on the water issues over there. But somebody gave them four hundred grand to help fund the fight. Well, I clicked on the link on their own page. It says Hatfield. Hatfield Group. Well, the Hatfield Group that their own page takes you to is out of Vancouver, Canada. Vancouver, B.C. Okay? Now, ask yourselves, this is what I, when I sat there and I read this, I mean, I'm sitting there looking at I don't, I don't believe this. And I'm looking at this saying, $400,000 from a foreign nation, basically. How does it come to fight for a water rights issue in our country? How? Because it's all interconnected through their strategic programs. They want sustainability. They're going to try to get sustainability. It's up to us to stay vigilant when they break it apart, when they go after it and overdo it. And then when you track the grant revenue that goes into it to keep it going, and then when you go to the sourcings and the, and the what they call the black hole revenues, unbelievable, unbelievable. Very simplistically, as of 2006, the Oregon, basically in the Medford area, okay, we received timber revenues 22 or 23 million dollars. And as of last year, year before, they received one million dollars. Okay. They got three million last year. Three million. Three. Okay. So that was a year before with this report that I read. I read them by reports, and I look at it. But they're suffering twenty-two million dollars out of their budget, basically, that they had as a solid type thing. So you cannot blame the county for wanting to get money if someone offers them at a grant. But that money is a trade-off. That money is, are you going to sell your soul or not? That's what we're forcing it to go on. We can't have it always. And it, I had, you know, like, I look at it in a very common sense thing, is that all, res all, all economies are basically resource-based. It just depends on the resource. What do you have? What's out there? What can you use? And what do you have to do? Well, I look at that and I think, you know, why every part of our laws that developed up to the past 15 years, basically, were geared that looked at man not as the criminal in it all, but as the, you know, we could change things. 
Now they look at it as you're a negative. You're in that one and ten. You know, and this is how the environmental community sees it. What in the world do we do? The, this slide here is a fascinating slide because it's with regard to the KBRA. All of these are stakeholder groups, and um, and with regard to stakeholder groups, taxpayers weren't represented, and ratepayers weren't represented, and we're going to go into your pocket for a billion dollars to tear out the dams. Then we're going to circle back to your pocket a year later and come in for a billion dollars to restore the Klamath River Basin to its natural state. And what's interesting is the natural state isn't during the Ice Age. You know, we, we could probably uh, try to achieve that by a great big refrigeration contract, right? It's not back to the era when the planet was a molten ball. We could do that with an A-bomb, right? <laughs> It's whatever somebody dreamed it should look like with trees and flowers and forests and the way they happen to like it. But you have to realize throughout history, our world has been changing. And the change isn't evolutionary change. The change is an environment that was created for your benefit and your happiness by our Lord. That's my personal opinion. There is a design and a teleology that is about everything that we do. I do not believe in randomness. You don't either. You've never taught your kids, go into the classroom and randomly answer the questions. <laughs> right? And you wouldn't like it if they built your car using random principles and they flew the airplane randomly. Right? There, nobody believes in randomness except for all of a sudden our world has been designed by random forces. Well, this is an interesting take. There's got to be a design. And the design puts you and me as human beings at the top of the ladder. And you and I have a requirement to use wisdom and prudence to guide our steps. And you can't just emotionally jump off the cliff because your neighbor's doing it. We are not lemmings, oddly enough. Why are we following the pack? The most important thing is, this is the slide that I showed you. This is the way it's designed to run, but this is the way it's running with this uh, collaborative governance here, this big red circle. The governor created this office through executive order. But by the way, your representatives installed it in law, Senate Bill 241, put it into law one year, excuse me, one year after the executive order. So the governor created an illegal body and then said, oops, I don't have the authority to, to really fund this machine. I need legislative authority to find a funding source. I'll ask my pet pals in the legislature to create legislation that will authorize this effort. And so this effort is now authorized. But your representative at the state level, your representative in the House, and the governor, even though they're elected officials, this collaborative effort is sneaking up on the backside and in instilling administrative law and hammering out sanctions. And that's why you see this idea with um, uh, well meters. And right now in the Klamath River Basin, any agricultural well within one mile of the Sprague River has been ordered turned off. Now the reason they turned off a well that's into the aquifer at 400, 800, 1,000 feet, wherever it happens to be, is because their claim is if you stop sucking water out of that aquifer, you'll add surface water to the flow of the river, you know? Water, way it, well, it, you would think it'd be the other way around, but this is what administrators do. They make stuff up as they go along. And if you make it up as you move down the road, it's really easy. Notice it's not documented in charter. It's not documented in the Constitution. It's not the normal way that a democracy works. It's not the normal way that representative votes get um, tallied, it's through stakeholder groups, and we're violating these principles, and they're doing it all day long while we're watching on. 
the, the, the killer is this sort of thing right here. Look at all of these people. The Klamath Citizens Group in Klamath County, Oregon, of which I'm a commissioner today, those are basically citizen and elected offices. Everything else is in Institute for Fisheries, Friends of the River, California Trout, American Rivers. American Rivers' motto is no dams. Well, what a great group to have in your dam blowing party, right? And so this, now they have an equal vote. The Klamath County Commissioners get one vote. American Rivers gets one vote. Okay, those, they just took us out of the battle. Where are the other guys going to vote? And all of a sudden, your voice ju just got the fire hose turned on it, and you have no voice any longer. So this is, this is a big deal. I'm going to move through here um, fast. The, Margaret Thatcher had a fantastic quote. To me, consensus seems the process of abandoning beliefs, principles, values, and policies. So it's something in which no one believes and to which no one objects, which is really interesting. It's so hard to get your hand on. What's wrong with collaboration? Collaboration's a great word. It's a good term. It works unless you're using it in a disingenuous fashion. Tell me the difference, if you can, between collusion and collaboration. Money. No, one's pejorative and one's nice sounding. This is political correctness. There's no difference between collusion and collaboration. None whatsoever. You and I can't tell the difference, but by golly, Collaboration and sustainable. No, does anybody here object to sustainability? <laughs> Nobody objects to it. And yet we know the principle is being abused. And your rights are being taken away. It's working like this. You believe in property rights. You believe in the individual. You believe in your God-given rights. Your inalienable rights. You believe in that, right? Anybody here? The way to defeat those rights is through the collective process. The way to defeat those rights is to um, destroy all the values you know and adore. Your family, under the gun. How about male and female? Who thinks those are the two genders of the human race? <laughs> oh, you guys, you laugh at me. You're so intolerant. <laughs> Look at how, if I destroy these principal concepts, male and female, I successfully destroy family values. I just successfully destroy the most basic unit of our culture. And now you're slowly losing your voice because I'm defining all of these ideas right out from under your very feet. This is where we have to fight the battle. What do we do and how do we get involved? How do we stop this? You have to get out of your seats. I'm saying you like you've been in the seats all night. You have been. We've been talking for hours. But the point is that we have to take over our school boards. Our children are being indoctrinated with sustainability and energy, and you guys are uh, thinking about smart meters and what those will do to your electric bill. I haven't had a meter at my house for 18 years. Ask me how and I'll tell you about it later. No meter at my house for 18 years. Think about what that must look like. No bills from the electric company, no meter, this is fabulous. They don't know how much energy I make or use. <laughs> Talk about freedom. You can enjoy freedom too. We need to take over our school boards. You have to get rid of uh, the um, Common Core. Don't let them slide Common Core into your school. They already did. You should, re you should read your children's textbooks, your grandchildren. Pick up a history book and read them what you want them to know. And when they're sitting in your lap, read to them. 
tell them about George Washington and Thomas Paine and Patrick Henry and these men who understand the laws of God and nature's God and the laws of nature's God. These concepts are important because this is where our foundation comes from. If you take those pieces away and you destroy the family, you destroy your relationship, if I were you, I wouldn't let your grandkids accept a free lunch. If everybody in the school said no more free lunches, they would end up with all this uh, crummy food at the end of the day, and they would have to throw it away, and somebody would complain because they're throwing so much food away. Right now, it's getting thrown away anyway. Kids take the sack lunch, they look inside, and it goes into the trash can. And if you dried up all the free lunches, we would see starvation impact our children if it were a real problem. It's not a real problem. They start with 100 free lunches, and they all get all those paper sacks disappear. So they put out 200 the next day. They all disappear. They brag about how many hungry kids are in town. 400 go the next day. 3,000 the next day, and on and on it goes. You know what I learned? I learned when you give away free stuff, people take it. <laughs> <laughs> and at some point, what we're doing is we're trading our freedom for free stuff. Yep. And it's all engineered through the fiat process of making money out of thin air. Our government is making money out of thin air. Until you talk to your state senator and your, your state representative and your federal representative and your federal senator and you tell them no more Federal Reserve, no more fake money, no more X and no more Y and no more Z, we will not tolerate it anymore. And if he turns around and calls you intolerant, vote him out of office. You guys deserve to have your country back, and it's up to us to take it back. So what we have to do is plug in, get involved, fight the good fight, and get involved. You come to the mic and speak to us as commissioners, and we will adore you for speaking the truth. If we hear from all of the other entities and never hear from the public at large, the table's turned. I need to hear from you weekly, and you guys need to be part of the action that makes a difference, because otherwise the other team wins. By default, the other team wins if you're not in the game. Thank you for coming tonight. I just have one quick announcement. Friday evening, Eagle Point Library, 6.30, Nate Winty will be presenting his third Constitution class. This one is on the jury right to jury trial and our responsibilities as a juror. And I believe Kurt Chancer is going to be there to say a few words about how Jackson County has taken away the right to jury trial. Um, so I would be there. Nate is a very good speaker and he's very interesting and compelling. So Friday, 6.30, Eagle Point.